Hi guys, my name is Jack, and today we're going to take a look at another horrible case with you. In the mid-2000s, this high-profile case shook the whole of America and was actively covered in the press. The horrific crime was investigated for several years before the killer was finally brought to justice. One of the main reasons for this delay was the lack of a visible motive and disconnected evidence, and no one simply could not believe that this man was capable of it. The investigation took almost six long years to put the puzzle together, and the investigator at the trial openly stated that he had never encountered anything like this in his many years of practice. In this tragic story, found a place and a love triangle, and double betrayal, and an ominous omen, which at first no one paid attention to. Jason Young. Not much is known about him. Jason comes from Brevard, North Carolina, where he was born in 1974. He grew up in an ordinary family, after graduating from high school became a student at the prestigious state university in the capital of his native state, the city of Raleigh, and after graduating, got a job as a salesman in a large retail chain. At work, Jason Young proved himself to be a valuable and promising employee who could always be relied on, but friends spoke of him as a man who was windy and fickle. In relations with the opposite sex, he was fickle and often changed women, for which he got a reputation as a womanizer, which, however, he himself was even proud. Michelle Marie Young, maiden name Fisher, was born in New York in February 1977. The girl was raised with her younger sibling Meredith, with whom they were very close from childhood. Their mother Linda spent a lot of time with her adored daughters, tried to support them in everything, and contribute to the development of their abilities and talents. Since her school years, Michelle was fond of law and economics, dreaming of linking her life with this very activity. After graduating from school, she applied to several universities at once and soon received a positive answer from the capital of North Carolina. The girl diligently studied at the Faculty of Economics and Law, receiving a master's degree in this field. After receiving her diploma, Michelle was hired for a high position in one of the leading accounting firms in the state. Yesterday's student was earning well, fully supporting herself and making big plans for the future. She decided to celebrate her 24th birthday at one of the most popular entertainment venues in the city with her close friends and colleagues. They were heartily enjoying themselves when some stranger awkwardly turned around and knocked a glass with a cocktail out of the birthday girl's hands. The guy immediately started apologizing and, to make amends, bought Michelle another cocktail. That young man was Jason Young, and the pretty young Michelle immediately caught his eye. He sat down at her table and started a casual conversation, joked a lot, tried to be witty and interesting, and at the end of the evening asked her out on a date. It should be noted that Michelle also liked the casual acquaintance, so she willingly accepted his invitation, deciding that it was fate itself made her a gift on her birthday. The couple began to communicate, and soon they realized that they had a lot in common. They both studied at the same university, although Jason got his degree three years earlier, supported the same hockey team, and were fans of the same music group. Between young people quickly began a romantic relationship, but to live together, much less get married, was out of the question. At the time of the beginning of his relationship with Michelle, Jason was still living at his parents' house in Brevard. He would only visit his girlfriend in Raleigh on weekends or meet with her during work trips to the state capital. During one of these meetings, his sweetheart informed him that she was pregnant, this news was a real shock for both of them, because neither of them was not yet ready for the birth of a child. Young people were keen on work, confidently climbing the career ladder, and did not plan to create a family yet. Jason said so at once, but Michelle, after some hesitation, decided that she would not have an abortion and would keep the baby. Jason took about a month to rethink the situation, after which he moved to Raleigh to be near his pregnant girlfriend. After a few more months, the couple officially legalized their relationship, though it was not love or pregnancy that contributed to it, but Michelle's lack of health insurance. Childbirth would have cost the couple a huge amount of money, but marriage gave them the opportunity to avoid such expenses. The daughter of the couple young was born in the spring of 2004. She was given the name Cassidy Elizabeth. 
The newly married mother went headlong into domestic life and family chores and helped her in this mom and younger sister. It should be noted that Michelle's family coolly accepted her chosen one. They were wary of Jason, but tried to avoid conflicts. In the same year, the young couple with a child moved to their own large house, located in a quiet and landscaped area of the city. Mother Linda, who came to visit her daughter and granddaughter and help with the household, was the first to notice that there was a certain tense atmosphere in this family. Son-in-law was too emotional, irascible, could arrange a scandal literally in the same place. But Michelle tried in every way to smooth out all the quarrels, and in public behaved like the happiest wife and mother. Only Mother Linda, she could sincerely tell about what was really happening. An ominous omen. When Cassidy was barely two years old, Michelle became pregnant again. She gingerly broke the news to her spouse, but he reacted calmly and seemed even happy about it. Soon, the family traveled by car to Brevard to personally tell the happy news to Jason's parents. They came to visit only for the weekend, and on the first day they celebrated the upcoming addition in the circle of relatives. And the next day, leaving their little daughter for a couple of hours with her grandparents, the couple went to a restaurant to celebrate the event together. As the couple was driving home, Jason, who was driving, overcorrected, oversteered, and the car went off the road into a ravine. The couple were frightened with a few abrasions and bruises, but their lives were not threatened. However, Michelle had a miscarriage on nervous grounds, because of which the young woman was very worried. Jason took it surprisingly calmly. The accident, the loss of a child and some strange indifference of the spouse, all this looked very suspicious. Later, Linda Fisher would call that accident a bad omen that no one paid proper attention to at the time. The young couple had a mutual friend named Michelle Mani, whom they had known since their days at the same university. For some time, they did not see each other, but in the spring of 2006, shortly before the accident, Jason, during a work trip, accidentally met an old acquaintance. He told his wife about it, and together they decided to invite Mani to visit him. The young woman willingly accepted the invitation, but during her visit began to complain about her unhappy family life and problems in her relationship with her husband. At the same time, she constantly praised Jason and told his wife how lucky she was. Pregnant Michelle was somehow not alarmed by such behavior of the guest. She sincerely wanted to comfort and support her friend, but Young took what was happening as a call to action. Jason had never missed an opportunity to flirt before, but this relationship quickly went beyond flirting and friendly support. Jason Young and Michelle Mani began calling each other almost daily and sneaking out to see each other. Jason always justified his absence by business trips, and his wife did not guess anything. In the summer of 2006, Michelle informed her husband that she was pregnant again, but this time Jason was not happy at all. The wife did not understand what was happening. She felt that the beloved away from her, but believed that this is due to the miscarriage that occurred a few months ago. Jason himself all this time was thinking hard about how to get rid of marital bonds with the least loss to himself. In early November, when Michelle was five months pregnant, her husband had another business trip. He traveled 300 miles away from home in his own car, but had booked a hotel room about halfway through the trip. That evening, a pregnant Michelle had a long conversation with her best friend on the phone, telling her about problems in the family and mentioning that she had had a big fight with her husband the night before he left. After the conversation, she went upstairs, put her daughter to bed, and fell asleep next to her. About 10 o'clock in the evening, Jason reached the hotel, and as he claimed to be tired from the road, went straight to bed. In reality, he was scrutinizing all the entrances, exits, and the location of the security cameras, planning how to leave the hotel, and then return undetected. Jason was preparing an ironclad alibi for what he thought would be the perfect crime. In the early morning hours, Young called his wife's sister to ask for help. He said he wanted to give his wife a piece of jewelry for their wedding anniversary, but he had accidentally sent a page from an online store to the home fax machine. He worried that Michelle would see his gift, and there would be no surprise. Meredith, though she disliked her son-in-law, still agreed to help him. When Meredith arrived at her sister's house, she entered through a secret door in the garage that only family members knew about and that was always unlocked. The house was suspiciously quiet, 
although the landlady's papers, keys, and wallet were in the hallway, indicating that she hadn't gone anywhere. When she went upstairs, Meredith saw that the bedroom door was wide open, but neither her sister nor her niece answered her call. When she entered the room, she saw a gruesome sight. Michelle was lying with a fractured skull on the floor by the bed in a pool of her own blood. Blood was everywhere. On the walls, furniture, and baby bloody footprints were visible next to the body. Unfortunately, no one could help the pregnant woman. She had been dead for hours. Her sister rushed to call the emergency services, when suddenly she heard rustling under the bed, looked there and saw little Cassidy, who looked at her incomprehensibly. Cassidy was not hurt, but she was frightened. The girl saw her mother's death, and afterwards spent many hours by her body, as evidenced by the marks on the floor, as well as the toys she brought to her mother. Later, forensic experts found a huge number of bruises, abrasions, and fractures on the body of the deceased, which spoke of a long and brutal beating. Michelle's teeth were knocked out, and her skull was fractured with a blunt, heavy object. Later, this instrument of crime was never found. A bloody pillow was lying next to the body, and the marks indicated that the victim had been smothered with it. Nothing was stolen from the house, which means that the night visitor had only one goal, murder. In addition, the locks had not been broken, and there were no signs of forced entry, indicating that the perpetrator had a key or knew about the secret door, which, again, was known only to family members. In such cases, the main suspect is always the spouse of the deceased, but he had a seemingly perfect alibi. He claimed that he checked into his hotel room and did not leave until the morning, and then went to a scheduled business meeting. A check confirmed that Young had used his room key card in the evening to get in and in the morning to get out. But a detailed investigation soon revealed a host of oddities and inconsistencies. For example, a hotel employee discovered early in the morning that the emergency exit was not only open, but also propped up with a cobblestone to prevent the door from slamming shut. When the investigation decided to check the surveillance camera pointed at that door to find out who had done it, it turned out that this very same camera had been deliberately disabled on the night of the crime. Moreover, it stopped recording about half an hour after Young checked into his room. The weirdness didn't end there. It turned out that during the night, a man who looked like Jason was getting gas at a station between the hotel and the crime scene. But during the night, he was asked to provide identification as per the rules. He refused to do so, threw cash, and without waiting for change, quickly left. The gas station attendant at the inquest identified Jason Young, but the man continued to deny everything, insisting that he had slept in his hotel room during the night. Another oddity was that on the day before the tragedy, Young called Michelle money more than two dozen times, and closer to morning he called his mistress five more times, with each conversation lasting no more than 15 seconds, suggesting that Jason was probably panicking. And all of these calls were made outside the hotel, where he, in his own words, had been all night. He was also late for a scheduled business meeting with his partners and looked somewhat confused. However, none of this evidence, either individually or all of them together, proved that Young had indeed massacred his pregnant wife. Years of investigation and a long-awaited verdict. For almost three years, Jason lived the life he'd always lived. Moreover, he achieved custody of his young daughter, which was a serious blow to the relatives of his dead wife. By that time, he stopped hiding his relationship with Mani, who was once friends with the murdered Michelle, which only increased suspicion that it was Young committed this brutal crime. Jason was arrested only at the end of 2009, but then, despite the large amount of evidence, to prove his guilt failed because the jury did not come to a consensus. However, the case was reopened in 2012, when more evidence was collected, and the testimony of witnesses who saw Jason Young that night outside the hotel in different places. In particular, his rather conspicuous white car was seen parked on the night of the murder not far from his own house, in an unlit lot. Also included in the case was the testimony of a child psychologist who told of little Cassidy's strange doll play, during which the girl showed how her daddy spanked her mom, and then she would not get up off the floor. Manny took the stand as a witness in court. She confessed that Jason had cheated on his wife with her, but justified it by saying that he was deeply unhappy in his family life, as he told everyone. 
and another former mistress of the defendant, admitted that she was afraid of his outbursts of anger when he lost control and could hit her. After a long trial, Jason Young was finally found guilty of brutally assaulting his pregnant wife. For this crime, he was sent to prison for life, with no right to ever be released. In 2014, convicted Jason filed his first appeal, but it was denied. In 2018, he again asked for a review of his case, but a panel of the State Court of Appeals again denied it. Cassidy was virtually orphaned. Her mother was murdered, and her father went to prison for the crime. The girl is being raised by her aunt and maternal grandparents. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead.